I'm here today with Scarlett Curtis, who's a writer and activist. Hi, Scarlett. Hi. Thanks nice for joining to me today. It's so nice to be here. It's so fun to see you again. I can't <laughs> believe we met earlier this morning <laughs> randomly. It was and then we're here today. So, yeah, I just, I'm really excited to ask you about just everything that you're up to because you're quite an accomplished 20 something year old and it's really impressive. And I love your writing. I love how passionate you are about life. And, um, and I want to hear a little bit about just like about you and the writing that you do and what really, um, I know you do all sorts of different things and you have the column Gen Z, but basically what's like, what are you, what is the activism that you're really passionate about? I'm women's rights. Yeah. So I, my, as I was just saying, my parents run a charity, um, called Red Nose Day and it's really big in the UK. And so charity was kind of this huge part of my life growing up. I always say that like charity was basically our family's religion. Like yeah. <laughs> it was just kind of what everything was centered around and it felt very natural, but it was always, their focus is really on poverty, like British poverty and poverty in Africa. And so it always felt pretty like disconnected and far away. And it was always based on this idea of like, we're really lucky, we're very privileged and it's our duty to give help. back yeah, yeah, and help those that aren't. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 14, uh, I had an operation on my back that went wrong and I ended up having to leave school and was kind of never really went back to school. Um, and I was like lived in chronic pain and was in a wheelchair and just had like a really horrible teenage hood. Um, and kind of during that time I was out of school, I was very kind of panicked about that. And I started to really try and educate myself. And a lot of what I was reading was the kind of work of these amazing, like feminist academics and theorists and activists. Um, I was reading like Gloria Steinem and Audre Lorde and, you know, just anything that I could kind of get my hands on. And I think it was really then that I started to connect what I was going through to this bigger picture and realizing that like it's the same systems that cause female genital cutting and child marriage are the, also the same systems that like I worry about having kids when my brothers don't or I you know was being treated differently by the doctors than I would have been if I was a man and um so I think for me that felt like this welding together of the issues that I was really cared about and was reading about and the thing that the ideals that my parents had installed in me. Yeah, that's um, beautiful. Yeah. And so how you said you were 14 when that yeah. started happening. Yeah. That's so amazing. And then what happened from there? Like you just got really involved or. Yeah. So I was so I was out of school from 14. And then when I was 15, I decided to start a blog. And at the time it was all about knitting because it was called teen granny because I was like stuck in bed. I couldn't walk. <laughs> the only thing I could do was knit and like bake occasionally um, and do weird crafts. And I was like, great, I'm going to start a blog about this. <laughs> and it was kind of at the time when you could like start like a really crappy WordPress site and people would still read it. And yeah. So I had my blog teen granny and all I talked about was knitting and like, you know, but, but it was kind of my saving. Like I was really disciplined about it. I put all my energy to, into it. It was like the ultimate distraction. I would set myself these like timetables of like, wake up, do some knitting, take photos of your knitting, write about it, post oh my it. Gosh. Um, and people started to read my blog and I kind of got really involved with this like online craft community. Um, <laughs> in the UK? Yeah, or just, in the UK, oh. kind of all over. I started writing for Hello Giggles, which was really kind of had just started. And I did a weekly column for them. Um, again about knitting and I started this group <laughs> called the twit knit group which was like me and all these other knitters and we would like knit things together and like in person no it was oh. all on twitter it was like the twitter knitting group and you'd kind of knit a square and then like post it to someone else and they'd add on and we did all these wow. different things um and so then and I think after a few years of doing that I kind of realized I actually wasn't very good at knitting um <laughs> But what I did like was writing um, and kind of assembling this blog. And so from then, from the blog, I started to get more opportunities like Hello Giggles to write for like different online magazines and then some newspapers in the UK and then magazines in the UK. And um, yeah, that was kind of how I started writing professionally. Um, and yeah, it all kind of went from there. 
And then what brought you to New York? So then when I was, when I was 17, I physically recovered because I'd been in like chronic pain pretty much from the what age of 14, was it, 17. What the surgery? So it was an operation for scoliosis, but something went wrong in the operation. Um, and so I was in chronic pain for like three years and no one could figure out what happened. Wow. Uh, and then they managed to reverse it when I was 17. Um, and then it took me quite a lot of years to kind of recover from that. And then when I was 19, because I'd missed GCSEs and A-levels, which are, well, I'd done two GCSEs, but- um, What's that? They're kind of like the big, it's like the equivalent of the SATs in the UK. Oh, okay. Um, I would never have gotten into any UK university without A-levels. Uh, so I took my SATs um, from, actually was in like a therapy center at the time. And I took them like from my therapy center. And it was all really <laughs> weird. Uh, and then applied to NYU and kind of wrote all these essays being like, I know I don't have A-levels, but this is what I've been doing. These are the newspapers I've been in. Um, and I'd really like to come and then got into NYU and then came here when I was 19. Um, and I'm in my last year of my degree now. What are you studying? I'm studying media activism and social movements. So wow. kind of like a mixture. Um, I'm in a school called Gallatin where you can like design your own major and mm -hmm. do whatever you want. Um, but it's really interesting. And what's Pink Protest? So... The Pink Protest is a group that me and my friend Grace Campbell founded. Um, and it's kind of, our goal is to just create a community of activists. It's at the moment, mostly British activists. Um, we just noticed that there were like all these women around us that were looking for some way to get involved and to do more. And then also I, so I grew up around charities and nonprofits and then I worked for a non-profit for like two years doing social media. Um, it was called the Global Goals. It's like in line with the UN. Um, oh yeah. So I knew all these people mm -hmm. from non-profits that were doing amazing work. And it felt like there was kind of this missing link, like connecting the two. Um, so the goal of the Pink Protest is to kind of make content for activists, campaigns around young people that we really care about that maybe don't have the resources to, you know, produce videos about themselves or produce, we did a protest recently, um, and I saw that. So yeah. providing tampons. Yeah. So to, that I never even like thought of that. I know it's mad. So we, one of our first projects as the pink protest was we made this video series interviewing 40 British female activists. And one of them was Amica George. And she's this 17 year old schoolgirl um, who started this petition called free periods, which is all around getting free menstrual products for all girls in the UK that already qualify for free school meals. So kind of the girls in the lowest yeah. income bracket. Um, and we were just, she just started this online petition and we just became obsessed with this issue. Like you said, it's something I never even thought about. Yeah. Something we really don't talk about enough. And it is a really big issue in the UK. Like one in four girls in the UK miss a week of school. Um, you think of that happening like I know about things I use things and I love that they're helping people you think about happening in third world countries like you don't think about it happening in the UK completely. or you know here and in actually the US. how yeah. it started was there was this organization um, that was raising money to send menstrual products to Kenya um, and they started getting all these letters from these girls in Leeds which is in the UK being like can you send some to us? Like, we don't have any. Um, and so that was what made people start doing this research. Um, and so we became really obsessed with this campaign and we started working with Amica. We built her website. We did a, more videos around it. We made all these graphics. And then we organized this protest, which was the Free Periods protest. And um, it was on December 20th last year. And we thought, my dad told me, he was like, you should get 10 umbrellas for the 10 people that are going to come in case it rains. <laughs> and I was like, I hope more people can't come. Yeah. come. In the end, 2,000 young girls came. We had four MPs come and speak. <gasps> we had Adjo Abwa, who's this model. All these amazing people come speak. Um, wow. And yeah, and then the next month we went into parliament to meet with them. And we're kind of at the moment trying to put together a policy proposal. Um, That's incredible. That so might get some funding. So successful. Definitely heard. Yeah, definitely. And also just showed that young people really do care and will show up. And it's not, you know, I think there's this accusation of collectivism that's thrown around all the time. And I think you just need something like this to prove that actually there are people behind these online petitions and they will go to really long, you know, extreme lengths to fight for these things that we believe mm -hmm. in. When was that? The end of December. So cool. it's like four days before Christmas. So what else do you have planned? Are they, so Pink Protest was helping her create the platform and help her with the 
um, movement around that sort of thing, but it's more than just that. Yeah, I think our goal, like it can be very tempting to kind of think that no one is already doing the things that you want to do. And I think my goal really isn't for us to be doing something that's like, this is our project, come support us, but to use the resources we have, the contacts we have to lift up other people that are already doing things. Yeah. So, you know, someone like Amica, she was 17, she's like still in school all day and didn't have the time to like organize the protest, get the media to come. And I really saw it as our place to just be there to like support her and provide her with all these resources. So I, I think that's really where we want to take it and what we want to do. We do... um on instagram page and we do a, a weekly series called on wednesdays we were pink and protest after the cool. me girls quote <laughs> so we give like a weekly action um today's one is about with one of our partners help refugees and the campaign they're doing in syria uh, which is really important and what is it um it's well i mean everything that's happening in syria at the moment is yeah. like awful and it, it basically their action for today was to call your local Russian embassy to ask them to kind of help out because Russia is really the people with all the power right now. Um, So we put that up today. So we're doing this weekly series. We're doing a monthly events in London um, where we kind of highlight a different activist each month and organize an event around them. Um, And I think we've got a few other really exciting projects coming up, which will be fun. Wow. Yeah, Yeah, there's a lot happening. Are you doing it so only in the UK or doing anything here? Um, yeah, I think we definitely want to start doing things here. I think one of the reasons I wanted to start it is because I've been exposed and involved with so much amazing activism in New York over the past few years. I think there's such an incredible community here around, you know, really organizing and feminist activism. And, um, I kind of just wasn't seeing, I I mean, I wasn't not seeing that in the UK, but I wanted to bring a little bit of that to the UK, but, um, yeah, I think ideally I'd love to do stuff here as well. Yeah, it's nice because sometimes you just really feel like you're preaching to the choir. So to take it out to somewhere that people obviously are interested and want and they do care and they do come out, but it's like not as prevalent maybe. Or Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just think, you know, there's no point doing something just for the sake of it. Like I think it's looking for where there's a space, where there's a need, um, who might need a bit more support that doesn't necessarily have it. Um, or have that platform and kind of, yeah, get involved there. What were you living in? I'm assuming you weren't because you're a senior at NYU now, but um, Brexit. Yeah, were you so there? I was or? Here, no, I was here during Brexit and I was like staying up till like five in the morning um, watching it all happen. It was Oh my mad. gosh. Yeah. So did it happen all of a sudden or could did you know? I mean, I'd been campaigning kind of in the months before, um, obviously, to vote remain um been support a lot of my friends did really amazing campaigns in the uk and it you know it was similar to the election here just a lot of yeah online campaigns and awareness and just trying to kind of explain what the vote would mean and what the brexit vote would mean um and how damaging it could be but i think it was a lot like the u.s election like none of us expected it to go mm-hmm. the way it went um and i think especially because it was before the u.s election and you know a lot of I grew up in London and a lot of my friends from London and London was massively predominantly voted remain um so I think for the people that I know it was a real real shock and definitely one of the first wake-up calls that we've had in the past few years of this kind of global movement towards a more extreme right wing yeah um, government well here it's interesting because um like ever since Trump's become president, I find myself so much more involved. And I mean, we see that or so I think I see that I see it in my own community, obviously, but I'm so much more involved, so much more aware. And even though I'm so, I'm not happy with the outcome. I'm so grateful that I'm able to like stand up and we're all feeling more empowered to make a difference. Do you find that that's the same in London? Like, how has it changed the landscape there? Yeah, I do. I think it's tough, isn't it, when you hear people say, like, maybe it's a good thing that it happened because yeah, everyone's totally. so much more empowered. And it's like, well, I don't know if you'd say that to, like, the people being deported. and You know, it's totally, not yeah. exactly a good thing. But the place I really see it, and I think this has a lot to do with social media and the current political climate, but is in, like, teenagers and especially 
I mean, I guess I'm quite biased, but a lot of teenage girls that I know um, are just so incredibly politically aware, know aware of their own opinions, like forming these really kind of extreme political like groups and organizations. And I think that's someplace I really notice it is in young people. Um, and I think that is kind of exciting, um, mm -hmm. especially if we're able to channel that into real political action. Yeah. What are you looking forward to as far as like when you graduate? What do you want to focus on? Um, I don't know. I kind of, I've been here four years now and I am thinking I will probably move home um, mm -hmm. when I'm done just because <laughs> it's been like incredible and it's been the most amazing experience and it's definitely living in New York's like made me who I am now and I have so much respect for the city but I do miss my family so much and I get very, very homesick. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to that yeah and just not having to write essays anymore although actually I think I'll miss it like I keep saying my dream would be just to be in school like constantly <laughs> um I know. for the rest of my life because it just feels like such a privilege and I'm so lucky and just everything I'm learning about is so applicable to what I'm working on and I just kind of wish I could keep doing it forever yeah well so you're able to make your own major is what you were saying yeah so what exactly are you like focusing I mean you mentioned what your major is that you created yeah. but like what sorts of things are you learning every day in class so I think you know I I worked as I said I work I used to work for this political organization and you know obviously a lot of the work I want to do is kind of in the realm of activism and I do feel this real responsibility to educate myself on the history of these social movements that I am now jumping on board of like mm -hmm. I think you know the we can all say like feminism's had this amazing re revival in the last few years but it never went away and there are these women that and men that have been working their whole lives for the last like hundred years um for this movement and it's got a lot of political roots and a lot of it's very complicated and, and you know I think I do feel a real responsibility to educate myself on it so a lot of the classes I'm taking are kind of on the history of social movements the history of like refugee and immigrant movements I took a class on um I took an amazing class last semester on the Black Lives Matter movement and kind of its roots in feminist queer theory and academia um I'm doing a class this semester called philosophical perspectives on feminism which is amazing wow. and it's all about kind of yeah feminist uh the roots of feminism in philosophy and how much of philosophy has basically just been like formed to say that women are like irrational and um it's very infuriating sometimes but <laughs> yeah so I think I really if I'm gonna do any of this work I really just want to be as informed as I can be how do you keep moving forward um even when you're feeling frustrated or down do you ever feel like you can't make a difference or do you just know that I think because so many of the people in my life work for nonprofits, and that's you know not something they do on the side that is something they do nine to often like midnight every single day for their Isn't whole career. Isn't that careers. your mom as well? Or? Yeah, it's my yeah. mom, my dad, you know, everyone, that, project everyone that I used to work for. There's one of my, yeah, this, I, I mean, I just, so many people in my life work for nonprofits and it isn't, sexy and it isn't fun and it isn't on trend it's really hard and it's really grueling and often you're trying to convince people of issues that aren't like in the headlines you know of things that maybe aren't having a moment and are actually harder to care about um and so I think because I've seen that I know just how hard work it can be and just how persistent and hopeful you have to be to make a difference I think this idea of like throwing in the towel and being like oh we're never gonna do anything why even try it's just so it goes against everything I've been raised on and everything I kind of really fundamentally believe in yeah that's so beautiful <laughs> I, I love know. that um, what do you ha like what advice do you have for someone who maybe lives in the midwest or in the country in the UK and maybe they're surrounded by individuals with different um ideals than them and and because I find that a really wonderful opportunity to inspire change among a community that 
maybe isn't as progressive. Yeah. So it is a great spot to be. But um, yeah, sometimes that's when people can um, get down on themselves. Completely. Yeah. And I think I'm very lucky that like everyone I have grown up around fully believes in what I believe in. And I think actually, you know, I feel so impressionable and like, I can't imagine growing up somewhere and being brave enough to have a different political opinion than your parents or the people around you. I mm-hmm. think that is one of the most incredible things. I think one thing would be really to use the internet and find, you know, to start with, find people online that feel the same way you do. And I think often it's really easy to feel alone, but there are so many organizations that are going to be fighting for whatever you care about. There are so many activists that are going to be fighting for whatever you really believe in. So I think to start with like, build up your online army of people that kind of feel the same way as you do. And then I really, I keep thinking about this of just, there's no, nothing ever comes out of anger. Like there's so many times when someone says something and you just want to be like, shout at them and tell them why they're wrong. And it's like, no one's ever changed their mind by being shouted at. Like you have to get to people by being gentle, explaining things, you know, it just kind of, yeah I think that's the only way forward but it is hard and I've actually never really had experience with that so I think (laughs) it's very impressive people that do no but that just reminded me of the article that you wrote about the lady that hated your hair yeah (laughs) when was that like in it was September yeah it was like last year it's actually really funny because I so my hair's um for people listening my hair's bleached pink and um (laughs) I did it like two years ago when I was living here and in New York, I felt that's almost more normal than having like blonde hair. Like I always forget, like I just, I'm like, it's fine. And then actually when I go back to London, that is noticeably like more people look at you and are like, what the fuck have you done? (laughs) Um, And yeah, this woman just came up to me and was like, looked at me and she goes, what have you done to yourself? I was like, oh, I just dyed my hair. Like, I like it. And she was like, well, it looks (laughs) awful and then we were like walking in the same direction so it was that thing when I was like just walking next to her like I'm really sorry I don't know what to do yeah <laughs> yeah it was mad. that's so awkward the fact that you were walking right next to her and then I but it just like reminded me I don't even actually know I like lost my train of thought but of what we were talking about of yeah just yeah, people just, not having the same ideas as you and like yeah, yeah not taking it too personally but and I think again I'm the biggest supporter of like the internet and social media because it kind of saved my life growing up but I think finding you need support like we all need people that feel the same way you do and if you can't find those people you know that lady would have hurt me a lot more if I didn't have like a A bunch of pink hair people I follow on Instagram that I can you know resort to and be like no you're my people like this lady doesn't matter and I think yeah it is a good analogy like you just need to know that you're not alone And then when you feel like you're alone, you can kind of have something to turn to. I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on Morning Matcha and hanging out with me here today. I love it. I don't like matcha, but I do like this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Well, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks.